Woo! For some of you, reality just set in. As you can tell, probably already this morning with all the marbles and an image of preschool, an image of elementary school, an image of junior high, and you see that cap and gown, an image of high school, that we're doing things a little different this Sunday. This is a transition Sunday. We're going to stop in our series of Judges because I think it's important to do things like this on occasion. We're going to stop, we're going to come back to Judges and tie that together. But in this week of transition, you're already experiencing transition. Whether you have children or not, you know that there's a big day coming tomorrow. That's going back to school day. Some moms and dads are cheering. Right? Some of you are sad because that first day of school is going to be at college for the first time for your child. So we're going to stop on this Sunday and just talk about the importance of children. The importance that children whether they're a newborn baby or walking out of the house, senior in high school, how important children are, not only to you in your home, I see the emotion in your eyes watching those videos, but how important children are to our church. Outside of the worship of God together and the principles of making disciples, when we put a priority, it should be on that next generation. Today I want to tell you why it's important to focus on children and then how we are going to partner with you. And you're thinking, wait a second, I don't have children. It still applies to you. How we're going to partner with you in leveraging your life for the spiritual formation of the next generation. I use that word partner because that's what it is. One of our core values at Tabernacle is that we believe that the primary source of spiritual formation for your children and for your home is not here at the church. It's in your home. But we as a church, we can equip you. We can work with you. We can give you materials and resources and passion and guidance from God's word so that you can leverage whatever you have to to get that child ready to face the world on their own. We're going to focus on that, not only how we're going to do that, but we're going to start with time, and then we're going to talk about different phases in your child's life, whether it be that preschool phase, elementary, junior high, or high school. Ladies and gentlemen, time is fleeting. The Bible says it's like a vapor time is in your life. It's here one day and gone the next. I have marbles in my hand. I'm going to explain to you, and you, you're going to understand why all these marbles are in front of you. These marbles represent... About a thousand weeks. You get about a thousand weeks, specifically about 936 weeks if your child is 18 when they leave. About a thousand weeks with your child from the time that they're born until they leave to college, which is usually that time where they start to separate from you and your influence. Notice the marbles get less and less as they go. Week one, it's pretty crazy. Once it happens, it's gone. And once that week is gone, you don't get it back, ladies and gentlemen. There's no picking up the marbles and putting it back in the bucket of time. As they get older, weeks go faster. Don't worry, we pick them up. If you're in my house one day, you wake up and you realize, wait a second, my son Christian's going to kindergarten. Have I done everything that I can to influence him spiritually, to be ready to interact with his teacher and other children who may not be believers? Next thing you know, the week's they start going faster and faster, and then I got a third grader. More weeks go by, and they start going faster, and I've got an 11-year-old. And you parents who are sitting there with college-age students realize that the older they get, the faster and faster and faster it goes until that last week yeah, that's how some of you are acting when your children are going to college. You put that bucket of time back in your mental memory bank, and you realize what? The time is gone. Your sphere of influence may continue, but nothing like it did when you had them in your home. It's messy with these marbles up here. You've got you to be careful where you step. You've got to be careful what you do. Life is messy with your children. That time you don't get back. Not only is that true for you in your home, but as these marbles are strewn across this stage, 
this messy reality of time is true for the church. At best, in a year, you give us 52 weeks. Now, that's not a reality for anybody in here. Anybody made it to church 52 weeks this year? No. Vacations, sickness, time off. We may get, at best, 40 hours with your children. What I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is that as a pastor, I'm convicted that we need to leverage these hours. We need to leverage these weeks and seize the day. Invest into that child in the phase that they're in right now. You have a limited window before they're gone. And that generation that leaves, that's the next generation that leads not only our homes, but our nation. We realize that when you see how much time you have left, you tend to get more serious about the time you have now. Psalm 90, verse 12, the psalmist says, Teach us to number our days, O Lord. Why do you want to number days? Why do you want to count them so that they matter? Why? He says that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. The heart of wisdom, whatever you know about wisdom, you know at least it's the opposite of ignorance. And if you're going to draw wisdom from somebody, you probably should draw it from God, and he gives it to you from his word. The Bible also tells you that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. We want to partner with you in leveraging your time to put wisdom, not only in your mind, but in your child's mind, before they leave. So we realize that when you see how much time you have left, you tend to make what matters matter more. So as I'm starting this message today, it's a little different, I know. But I want just to, to shatter you a little bit, to, to rattle your mind, to wake you up to the reality that time is fleeting. And I hope that it's got your attention so that we can start to pour into you what we're going to do about that here at Tabernacle. You know, when you think about time or that time clock in a sports venue, it's not that important at the beginning of the game as you watch that time clock go down. If it's a football game, first quarter, you're like, okay, the coaches really want the kids to be thinking about that the whole game, but they really don't until later in the game. If it's a basketball game or however long the game is and however much time you're given for each part of the game, it tends to get more serious, the time clock does, the closer to the end of the game you find yourself. Towards the end of the game, when there's not a clear winner or a loser, it starts to get real crucial, that time clock, as it clicks down. I think back to the state championship. Last year, we're in Cowboy Stadium. You know, we wanted the boys to think about the time in the first and second quarter. We're a little behind. We don't worry about that because we're coming back the second half. We have time. Suddenly, when we're behind and they're about to kick a field goal with a little more than a minute and a half left in the game, time is pretty important. And as they missed that field goal, each second that rolled off that clock mattered. And towards the end of the game, you started to see a refocus of the priorities, a refocus on the intent of the game. Ladies and gentlemen, when you start looking at the time clock of your family, don't wait until the senior year to get concerned about it. Think about that time now so you can have a refocus and reprioritize whatever you have to do to spend time where it needs to be with that child. Suddenly start to think about when you view time as not being there forever. What can I pour into my child before they go off to college or to school or a job? At Tabernacle, we take this very important. We're starting to more and more. Uh, We use a curriculum called Orange. It's written by a guy named Reggie Joyner in the Rethink Group. You don't need to know all that. You just need to know that as we're using this new emphasis in our children's ministry, we are chiefly reminded every week about the time that you and I really don't have. In fact, much of this concept and and much of the content that you will hear today comes from this orange curriculum. And I I started going through it. I started reading the word. I started listening to the concept. And it reminded me. I start getting choked up just watching videos and reading the word last week about how important time is in our life for our children. With the time that we do have with our children, we want to make sure every child knows what it means to love God and to love others. We know that they cannot really understand what it means to love God outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we want them to come to know him as Savior. We want every child to know what it means to be a true follower. 
We want every child to know what it means to live in biblical community. We want every child to embrace the truth of Scripture. So it changes their view of not only themselves, but the world that they live in. But here's the reality. We cannot force these things on our children. I cannot make your children believe these things or acknowledge these things. But what can we do? We can influence them. We can partner with you to bring these realities up to you and equip you to influence them. You cannot make a child believe the Bible, but you can influence a child to see truth from the Bible. You cannot make a child love God or love Jesus, but you can seize the day, you can leverage your time and show the love of God to a child. You can tell them about the love of Jesus. My question is, are we leveraging the time? Are we taking advantage of the time? Or is time just fleeting by because we're so distracted with our own life, our own careers, and our own direction? You know, sometimes we get distracted and sometimes we get flat out frustrated. We'll spend time with a child and we get frustrated and want to quit. Why? Because we don't see the child showing the spiritual change that we're trying to teach them. Right? Think about a ninth grade boy as he's transitioning maybe seventh, eighth, or ninth grade. You come to me and say, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I don't see change in this ninth grade boy. Oh, so you expected him to come to you after a Sunday morning of you teaching him as a mom or a teacher, and that ninth grade boy walk up to you and say, you know what? Mr. or ma'am, I so appreciate you teaching me God's word last week. It totally changed my perspective. And everything that I was doing, I'm going to stop doing, and everything that I'm supposed to do, I'm going to start doing tomorrow because of what you said from his word. Oh, they didn't come to you and tell you that. Well, don't hold your breath. Don't wait for that moment. It may never happen, but just because you don't see the change doesn't mean the change isn't happening. Don't get distracted. Don't get off course and don't get frustrated. Keep showing up. Keep loving. Keep investing because this you know is true from your own life. Time matters because it's fleeting, but time over a period of time has an effect. You just keep on keeping on. Keep teaching. Keep loving. Keep showing up in that child's life. And I promise you, just like you, they are listening as well. Ladies and gentlemen, time matters. What happens over time collectively matters. Some of you right now are sitting in this message, and I insert it at this point, because right now is about the time where if you don't have a child at home, or maybe you're not a, a thanking or influencing grandfather or grandmother, you're starting to tune me out. You're starting to look at the bulletin. You're starting to think about what's on my iPhone. You're starting to think about my stomach is a little hurting. What am I going to get for lunch? This doesn't concern me, Pastor, because I don't have that direct influence of a child. Oh, you couldn't be more wrong. It's easy for parents. I mean, parents know. They're watching the videos. You're the ones that are crying. Grandparents are like, oh, yeah. I, too, have been invited into the circle of influence for my grandchildren. Those are both true. But there's more influencers here than you realize. If you teach school, the school district and those parents have opened the door of the sphere of influence into that child's life. Will you seize that opportunity? If you live in a neighborhood where there's a child down the street, are you going to be looking at the phases of their life so that you can leverage whatever you have to to influence them for the gospel of Jesus Christ? You should. You should are or you can and should be an adult influencer in a responsible way in a child's life do not let this message fall on deaf ears and if you're still not convinced i want to show you why this is important for you and for our church here it is because children are important to god and they should be important to us If you're an educator, you already get this. That's why you're doing what you're doing. If you're a parent, you need to get this. If you're a grandparent, you need to get this. If you're not any of those that I lifted above, you still need to get this. Children are important to God and should be important to us. Reggie Joyner puts it like this, and this is straight from the Bible. Every child is created in the image of God, and you should treat them as such. To clarify, it means every child is important to God, and every child should be important to us. Whether they look like us, whether you like that child or you don't like that child, whether you understand that child or you don't understand that child, every child, no matter what their age is, what color of their skin, 
how much they weigh, whatever stage that they're in, whoever they are, every child is important to God because they are created in his image. They're important to God because he created them, not only to create them, but he wants to know them. And guess what he's done? He's put the responsibility to share how they can love God in your hands, parents, grandparents, and adult influencers. Doesn't that blow your mind? Think about that for a second. The God of the universe creates a child to be born into this world. He wants desperately to know that child. He wants that child to come to salvation through Christ alone. But who does he ask to share the gospel with him? He asks you. Surely, parents and children volunteers and anybody else who will get a listening ear of a young adult. They're also important to Jesus. You see that through the scriptures. I want to show you two instances. In Mark chapter 10, if you want to turn there with me. Jesus here is, he's often doing his speaking. And he tells his disciples out of frustration, allow the children, in Mark 10, permit the children to come to me. And then he says, do not hinder them. It's not often that I read one verse in the New Testament and you see two commands. Permit or allow and do not hinder. Both of those are imperative commands. It's not a suggestion. And Jesus says it with a little bit of sting. Why? Here's what the disciples were doing. They see how busy Jesus is. They see how he's healing people and how his ministry is exploding. And they see these little children and their families like, no, no, no. Don't bother Jesus. Jesus says, you permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. It says when the Bible saw what Jesus was doing, I mean what the disciples were doing with the children, the Bible says Jesus was angry. It's the kind of anger that arises out of observing some type of injustice. Jesus just wasn't irritated because he was hungry. He was irritated as his, at his disciples because they were doing a grievous injustice by not allowing the children to come to him. Children are important to Jesus. So we should be following that model. We should not be hindering children to come to Jesus, but we should be doing the opposite of that. What should we be doing? We should be bringing children to Jesus. Just like he wanted 2,000 years ago, he wants the same thing today. Ladies and gentlemen, no one should feel more comfortable in this church than a child or a teenager. And you say, well, that's not me. I don't care. We as adults have to be the ones that say, you know what? For the sake of the glory of the kingdom and the next generation, I might have to do something that's a little uncomfortable. I didn't say unbiblical, a little uncomfortable. I may have to take something away from my preference to give so that a child can be presented to Jesus. We think like this at Tabernacle because I think Jesus thinks like this. That is why we put so much money and time and resources in the kids' town. If you didn't come to the family worship experience yesterday, you couldn't have probably fit anyway. It was just booming, and there was just a few families in there. That room that has been redone, it's beautiful, you should go in there. It was just thriving with children and adults. It's only going to increase. That is why, why when we build the next building we're going to build, it's going to be a children's building. That's our next focus. That's our next priority. That is why we're going to continue to go and invest in the public school system as much as we can. That's why we do Kids Beach Club where we go into a school with the Bibles and we teach whatever we can at whatever time we can so we can influence them. That's why we do upward basketball for the children that believe and the children that don't believe because children are a priority and they're important to God and they should be important to us. Instance number two, look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, 1, Jesus said, or we're discussing the time of Jesus. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Look at how Jesus answers in Matthew 18, 2. He called a child to himself. Kind of strange. And he set the child before him and before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as a child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such, like this child in my name, receives me. Then look, he starts talking specifically to the children. Not just as an illustration, he says in Matthew 18, 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone tied around his neck, and he would be drowned in the depth of the sea. When Jesus is asked a very important question, he brings a child. He uses this child as a multifaceted illustration for us. 
And whatever you believe it means to come to the kingdom of God like a child, you know, at least has to come with a simple knowledge, not complex knowledge. The child at least has to come with humility. You see how an elementary school believer believes in Jesus once they come to Jesus as their Savior? I have two. Actually, I have three now in this stage. They're, they're convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that salvation is in Christ alone. They believe that he's the king of the universe. And they're just like, whatever he says, I'm going to do. Notice Jesus doesn't say, the children must become like adults to get into the kingdom of heaven. He says, no, we as adults must become like the children. So whatever you believe it means to come to the kingdom of heaven like a child, it means at least this. Children are a priority and their attitude is a priority to the God of the universe that you and I serve. Not only does he say, come like a child, but look at the other illustration. He says, when you welcome a child, you welcome me. But if you hurt a child you're better off dead. If that doesn't show priority for children, I don't know what does. I wonder, do you welcome children into your life, into this church, like you would welcome Jesus? If you knew that Jesus was about to walk in those doors in a few minutes, how would you act as those doors were opening? Probably a little different than you act when a child is frustrated, or you're frustrated with the child's behavior or attitude. We get so frustrated with children, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. Children have sin, and they need discipline, just like you and me. But I wonder if we started looking at, instead of just focusing on children have sin and they need discipline, which is true, we started looking at children like we think about Jesus. We started welcoming children like we would welcome Jesus. Why do we help children grow, even the ones who don't know Jesus yet? Because they are a priority to God and they're made in his image. Why do we reach out to families in our church and families that aren't in our church? Because their children are important to God and are created in his image. Why do we support pregnancy centers and stand up for those children who cannot speak for themselves and fight abortion and fight child sex trafficking and stand up for social issues? Because at the heart of every believer is Christ, and at the heart of Christ is a compassion for children. We know this. We get this. Every one of you sees a child abused, and it breaks your heart, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Because at the core of who you are is Christ, and at the core of Christ is a love and a priority for children. Ladies and gentlemen, here's my admonition to you today. Act like children are important and made in the image of God. Here's where we're at so far. Time is fleeting. You only get so long with the children that you're influencing. Children are important to God. And if you've come with it this far, then you ask, okay, what are we going to teach them? What are we going to focus on in that limited amount of time that we have to influence a child? That is a great question. At the core of that question, the foundation of that question is the foundation of our faith. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 now. Deuteronomy chapter 6, you find something called the Shema. It is our number one priority. Moses here is recording these words to the nation of Israel, a community of believers, not just parents. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That means your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Then what do you do with them? Look at Deuteronomy 6, 7. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You're like, okay, that's Deuteronomy 6. That's pretty important, maybe for a Jew. What about for us today? When well, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is asked a great question. He's asked by a Pharisee, what is the greatest? What is the most important commandment? What does Jesus answer with? The same verse I just read, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus answers them in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. Then he summed up the rest of the law by saying, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend, what does he say? The whole law and all of the prophets. To love God and to love others, that is what is most important. We know, of course, as a New Testament believer, we have the rest of the Bible to go by. The only way you can truly know how to love God is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says the best way that you can show God that you love him is by showing others love like you would want them to love you or like you love yourself. 
And the best way to do that is to share the gospel with them. We will make this a priority as we teach our children in the limited time that we have to produce an authentic faith before they leave your home. These commandments are going to be our focus. Authentic faith can be described as trusting Jesus in such a way that transforms how you love God, yourself, and others. We'll have one rule that will find itself and flow through each message that we're teaching your children, whether they're in preschool, elementary, junior high, and high school. And that one rule is going to be love. Now, some of you Bible lovers like me, as soon as you hear that, you're like, okay, here we go, the love thing. No, it's the love thing. You can't get away from the love thing. Everything centers around God's love for you and how you love others. Now, do we teach judgment? Absolutely. Do we teach sin? Absolutely. But why? So that we can point them to God's love. It goes together. One rule is going to be love. Love God, love myself, and love others. In the limited amount of time that we have, we're going to teach them how to love God through a relationship with Jesus Christ, how to love others and share the gospel with them as well. We have a limited time. I was thinking about sixth graders. You do some research about sixth graders, and you realize that at best I may get 40 hours with most of your children if you're very active in church. But with a sixth grader, they come about half the time, statistics show, through churches all across our nation. That means we only get about 25 hours a year with a sixth grader. The average middle schooler will use their smartphone, their smartphone more in one week than they'll be attending church in one year. Think about that for a second. The average middle schooler will spend 200 hours a year learning math. 300 hours a year watching TV or movies. 600 hours a year playing on their smartphone. In an ideal scenario, go back to that time we get, we get 25 to 40 hours with your children to teach them what matters. Therefore, we must prioritize truth. And we must create content that matters to your children. I realized this week that it's not our job to teach your child everything that's in the Bible. We can't do it in the 25 hours a year that we get, maybe 40 hours. If you want your child to know everything that's in the scriptures, you're going to have to take some of that responsibility. We're going to focus on what matters, and you're going to take it from there and help us focus on what matters. That's my suggestion to you today. Everything in the scripture is worthy to study. You know that. I teach right out of the Bible every single week. We go so many times, verse by verse and book by book. I want you, as you continue to grow in your faith, to study everything in here. I realize that everything in this Bible is equally true. I believe in inerrancy. It's all true on the same level of truth. But not everything in here is on the same level of importance. Would you agree? I hope you would. Would I rather spend time teaching your child about all the articles in the tabernacle? Or rather, show your child how Jesus fulfills their articles and how they can have a relationship with him. Well, for example, what does Jesus answer when he's asked, what is the most important command? Does Jesus say all of them? Does Jesus say everything? No, he says this is the most important commandment, that you know to love God with everything that you have, and you love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what we're going to focus on through every lesson. He prioritized what all that meant. Love is the distinctive of the gospel. Love is the distinctive of the church. Loving God and loving others. Jesus lived to model God's love. Jesus died to prove God's love. Jesus rose from the dead so that we could be empowered with God's love. Not only is love the distinctive of the gospel, but love should be the distinctive of the church. Jesus says, you will recognize my disciples by their what? By their love. So we see time is fleeting. We see children are important to God. We're going to be focusing on how to love God through relationship with Jesus Christ, how to love others as yourself. That means sharing the gospel with them. But how are we going to do that? That's why we brought all this before you today. We're going to do that by helping you leverage the time in each of the four major phases in your child's life. This first table over here represents preschool. The second table in the marbles is going to represent elementary. This third table is going to represent junior high. And this fourth table is going to represent high school. And you see they're coordinating a little image of what their room may look like behind me. We want to help you see the phase of a child and realize every phase that they're in is going to be a little different. Now, when we think about the phases of the child, usually as a parent, I don't give this much consideration. 
I want my child to respond the way that I think they should respond rather than the way they are going to respond. We're going to try to help you with God's word to see each phase of their life and how they're going to respond differently so you can leverage that phase to teach them the truth of how to love God and how to love others. Now, these four phases are preschool, elementary, middle school, and high school. Each phase matters, and we're going to have a word associated with each phase. When you think about preschool over here, you think about the baby all the way up to right before they go into elementary school. The word we're going to focus on here is embrace. We're going to embrace that child and give that child physical security so they can learn to trust and point them to trusting God. Very simple. They're asking a question at this phase, by the way. The question is, do you see me? And as they go from pre-K to kindergarten, and this is a big group here, from kindergarten all the way right before they go to junior high, we're going to focus on the word engage. Engage. We're going to try to see that phase of their life and engage that child where they are. Learning is a lot of fun here. They like to have a lot of fun. So we're going to engage them with the fun that they want to have so they can see how to love God more. They're asking a question here. Do I matter? Do I have what it takes? Then as they transition from elementary to this phase that we all love, junior high. Right? This key word here is something that's going to surprise you. It's affirm. You're going to have to learn the art of not freaking out in the junior high phase. We're going to have to learn some patience in the junior high phase. We're going to teach you how to recognize that phase and affirm them all the way so you don't kill them. They're asking a question here. It probably won't surprise you. Do I have friends? As they transition from junior high to high school, the most scary phase for us as parents. The word here is mobilize. We're going to teach them how to mobilize and to own their future and to own their faith. They're asking a question here. Who do I like and who likes me? Lisa and Shannon were going to an orange conference for this curriculum and this phase thing that we're teaching you today. And they met a dad. A dad had a tragic loss in his life. He had four children and his wife just died. He had one child in each of the phases. He was so frustrated with how each one of them was dealing with the loss of his wife, their mother. He couldn't understand it. This child in preschool was just getting attention and crying out all the time, just doing little things so that the child could get attention. What was that child saying? Do you see me? And he was frustrated with how this child was dealing with the loss of his wife until he realized they just want to be seen. Then he learned how to communicate with that child and show them the love of God. His elementary school daughter, she wouldn't talk about it at all. All she wanted to do is work and do things. She was asking the question, do I have what it takes? He was frustrated until he looked at it from that perspective. He had, I believe, a son in junior high, and all he wanted to do was say, hey, can my friend Johnny come over, or can I go to Billy's house? The father wanted him to deal with the loss of his mother. All he wanted to do was go to a friend's house. He was asking the question, do I have friends? And help the father see the perspective. And then his high schooler was just wanting to text his girlfriend all the time and be a part of that relationship. He was frustrated until he realized the question that was being asked is, who do I like and who likes me? Ladies and gentlemen, we want to help you recognize these phases and get guided by the word of God. Take advantage of each phase so that you can teach your children to love God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. All of you have the potential to be an adult influencer. Whether it's the childhood in the neighborhood, or it's the childhood in your home, or in the childhood in your classroom. We want you to seize the opportunity and leverage the time and your resources to invest into these children for the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Children will be a priority here at Tabernacle. We have hundreds of children meeting over there right now, and it will continue in the second service. We need your help. I get so frustrated when I hear people say, I've given my time, and now I'm moving on to something else. When are children going to stop being a priority for our church? When are children not a priority for Jesus? Therefore, when should children stop being a priority for you? I don't know if that should be answered. You may have to give some of your time. You may have to give some of your resources. All of us need to leverage distinctive opportunities to make an impact throughout the different phases of a child's life. You say, Pastor, what's the most important phase in my child's life? The phase that they're in. 
Don't worry about the next phase. You can think about it. And for some of you, don't stress out about the phase you just missed. The most important phase in your child's life is the phase that they're in. Will you take advantage of it? Why? Because time is fleeting. Children in this world, whether they're in your family or not, are important to God and created in his image, and they should be important to you. We'll be focusing on the one rule, which is love God and love others. And we will look at one word for each phase. Because I want all of you in here today to leave a legacy. Now, legacy may be a little different than what you're thinking. It is. It's not your name and lights. You're going to be forgotten one day. I got news. <laughs> one day your name won't be remembered, and your picture will just be another picture of another photo album that sold at some auction. But you can leave a legacy. Notice I didn't say an inheritance. An inheritance is what you leave for someone. That's not that important. A legacy is what you leave in someone. That's what makes your life matter. As we're thinking about legacy, as we're thinking about the phases of a child's life, there's a group in here that is affecting all the phases of our children's life. It's the teachers and educators and administrators in this room. So before we leave here today, I want to seize the time and take an opportunity to pray for you. If you're an educator, if you're in administration, if you're a stay-at-home mom that is homeschooling, if you're teaching at a private school, whatever your role is, if you're in somehow in the education, would you come forward? I want to pray for you. I know you don't want all the attention, but I need you up here. Don't be afraid. Come on, I see you over there. Come on, if you're in education, make your way forward. Okay, and I wanted you to see this as they walk forward this morning. It's a, it's a lot of us. I don't care what your role is. Come up. Come right in here in these tables. I'm going to come pray for you. Get as close as you can. Unsung heroes here. Teachers, as you're coming up, educators, you're coming up, administrators, you're coming up, coaches, adult influencers, I want you to know that we have a resource for you at Home Point right out here in the hallway, and it's going to give you each of these phases on one piece of paper so you can see whatever grade you're teaching, whatever grade you're coaching, how to leverage whatever you need to to take advantage of that phase. Moms and dads, we have information over here for you as well in Home Point so you can see whatever phase your child's in. As we leave here today, let's all bow together. If you'd like to come up and lay a hand on one of these educators, one of these administrators or coaches, these adult influencers, go ahead and come up now. We're just going to pray over them. If you don't want to get up, just kind of reach your hand out. We're going to pray for them. All right, let's bow together and pray.